You're wondering why I brought a tear today. And what I decided to do, I thought I'd preach so long I'll probably wear out and may need a place to sit down. But uh, I'll come up with another use of it between now and then. Isaac asked me this morning, hey, have you had a chance to go deer hunting yet? And I said, well, not yet, but I'll be good for it. And it reminded me of a story when, uh, when we lived in Canada. You know, virtually all of Canada is owned by the federal government. They call it the crown there. And so most of the hunting, all the hunting that we did was on crown land. And so you couldn't put up stands and feeders and all that sort of thing. It's actually against the law to put up feeders. But I built myself a chair. And it was a chair sort of like this. It swiveled anyway, like this chair swivels. But then I went to work on it. And I built a, I welded a, a, a gun rest on it, you know, so I could get a good solid rest and everything. And then I did something that I should have patented the idea because I'm going to let it out today. And it's going to go on the World Wide Web in two weeks. They're going to be on sale at, the, at uh, the, the stores. But I put a rear view mirror on my chair like you have on a bicycle, you know, and so I mounted it there. And you're saying, why do you want a rear view mirror on your chair? Well, so I don't have to be turning around all the time. And so I could hunt one direction and hunt the other direction without even turning it. So I was watching my rear view mirror this one morning, and, uh, you know, it was cold and snowy, and I was on this place that I always hunted on. I, I, in six years, I never saw anybody else, so this was public land. And that's kind of what I liked about it. That's what I like about hunting, mostly being alone. So I was sitting there alone in my chair, and uh, wouldn't you know it, I was on a cut line, a clearing or a sendero that we would call it here, and I saw a deer in my rearview mirror. But I could see pretty quickly he wasn't the kind of deer that I was after, so I was just going to watch him, and I was enjoying watching him. And, and in just a few minutes after he kind of came out, I was watching him there, all of a sudden, it was like somebody yanked his feet out from under him. And he went straight down to the ground. And then I heard a shot. And I thought, oh no. You know, I thought I was by myself. And so I was watching that deer while somebody else shot it. Well, that's kind of a big deal, isn't it? You know, you know I'm not alone anymore, I guess. So I got up out of my chair and, and went and walked back. It was about 100 yards away where this deer had been shot. And as I walked up to it, this girl walked up to it too. She was carrying an open sight uh, liver action, thirty thirty, and it was her very first deer. And she was all excited about this deer, but didn't have any idea what to do with it. And so I said, well, you know, I have a sharp knife. And so we started uh, field dressing the deer, and before long, their, her dad and another friend came up. They had heard the shot. And so I just thought I was going to spend the morning alone watching and enjoying the deer, and then this big old crowd shows up. But it was fun anyway. She got her first deer, and, and so it was all exciting. You know, the reason I tell that story, there is a point to it, is I really do. Some of the things that I enjoy, the, probably the biggest part of hunting that I enjoy, is just being alone and being out in the quiet and then being out in nature and getting to see God do his thing and just doing that alone with him. And, and it really is. It's just like extended quiet time season for me when deer season comes along. And, you know, there's a lady, we're going to read her story in just a few minutes. It's in John chapter 4. If you want to go ahead and be turning there in your Bibles, I didn't print it out for you this week. I wanted you to read it in your Bibles. And if you have to read it on your phone, that's okay. You have permission, turn your phone on and uh, look up John chapter 4. This is a story about a lady, much like the worship team just sang. And he talked about the rose that had been trampled. And it reminded me of a story that Matt Chandler tells, speaking to a group of college kids. And, and actually, Matt Chandler was in the group, but another man was speaking to this group of college kids. And he had a rose, and he held it up for everybody to see, and talked about how pretty it was and, and everything. But he said, you know what? Let's just pass this around. And so... You know, he gave it to one person, he passed it down the row and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, lots of people were there. And by the time it got to the end, they brought the rose back up to him. And by this time, you can imagine what it looked like. It was all crumpled and mashed and like it had been trampled on the ground. And what he was trying to communicate to the ladies in the room in particular is uh, don't let yourself be trampled. Save yourself. Is a call to purity. Good point, right? And he said, 
Who would want this rose now? Nobody would want this rose now. He's trying to make his point, but Matt Tanner was sitting with a friend, and she was like a rose that had been trampled on. In fact, she was much like the lady we're going to read about here in just a minute. And as the preacher was saying, who wants her now? And he was sitting there thinking, Jesus does. Jesus wants her still. And he was sitting by his friend hoping that she wouldn't get the wrong message. Well, the lady that we're going to read a story about in a minute is just like that lady was and just like the rose had been trampled on the ground. Let me give us a little bit of cultural context and we'll read the story together. In the first century... Uh, women had a strike against them. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't have voting. There was no democracy yet. But they couldn't testify in a court of law because their testimony was not thought to be valuable, was not to, thought to be, uh, uh, to be taken seriously. So by society as a whole, women were looked down upon. And in the Middle East, Middle East today, much of that is still going on. But then, that was the one strike, she was a woman. The other strike she had against her was that she was a Samaritan. And you, we've talked about it before many times, how the Jews really looked out upon the Samaritan people. And remember, we're going to talk about how Jesus had to go through Samaria. Most Jews avoided it altogether. They wouldn't even go through the place because they, of their disdain for the Samaritan people. So, she was a woman, she was a Samaritan. But she had another strike against her. In fact, five strikes against her. She was a divorcee. Five times divorcee. And so she was ostracized and looked down upon. I imagine she was bullied and made fun of. And so the story that unwinds today that took place by well is usually a gathering place for the people. They would come, the women especially, in the mornings to get the water for the day. And then in the evenings they would gather in the cool of the day. But in the middle of the day they would avoid it. You can imagine why. It was hot. You know, the country is very much like the hill country north of here, about 50 miles. Rocky, limestone, hot. And so the, the wells were usually a place where you wouldn't find anybody in the middle of the day. And so this lady chose the middle of the day to go get her water because she just wanted to be alone. But I picture her, she was walking up to the wells. We're going to read in a minute. As she was walking up, she was going, well, well, well. What do we have here? Let me turn my little button on. And that's the name of today's message. Turn with me, if you would, John chapter 4. Let's read that story together. And we're just going to make our way down through there. And First, I'll show you a couple of pictures. You know, this story took place, conversation between Jesus and a woman took place by Jacob's well. And it's a real place, and it's about 45 miles north of Jerusalem, I'm told. And uh, it was uh, the well that Jacob, you remember, I, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that Jacob had, uh, had dug is 100 feet deep, still is today. And uh, you and I could go and see that very well, the place where this conversation took place today if we wanted to. But now it's, uh, it's, it's, in, it's, it's in a church now. And in uh, 386 A.D., you know, they, they built a church at that site because it's a holy site, you know, where this conversation took place. I wish it were kind of still out in the countryside and the place where I could go and be by myself, you know, beside that well. But it's, this is that, that very well. But there's an artist who uh, drew this picture, and I'll just leave that up there while we read the story. This is the way he depicts, and it's probably more accurately what the setting would have been like when this story took place. So let's read that together. John chapter 4, it's called The Woman at the Well, but let me call it The Woman Who Had Lost All Hope. And let's uh, read about her encounter with Jesus. We'll begin at verse 4, okay? And he is Jesus. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's son, uh, well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. I think even Jesus enjoyed peace and quiet. And it was about noon. So there's the well, and Jesus was sitting there in the middle of the day. Verse 7 is where I am. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, 
Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, remember she was well aware of the customs of the day, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I think she was saying, well, 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 who do you think you are? I wonder if she even thought he was there to kind of flirt with her. But she had had a fill of that. We'll read about it in a second. Verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift, what a great word, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. To which I think she rolls her eyes it's in my own imagination and replies, sarcastically maybe. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Remember, it's 100 feet deep. Where can you get this living water? I suspect a tone of sarcasm. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave this well and drank from it himself and as it also is livestock? She's trying to blow him off. I didn't come here for a visit. I came here for water. I don't need your attention. Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He wasn't deterred by his, her sarcasm, I don't think. The woman said to him, she kind of won him over, I guess, Sir, give me this water so I won't have to get thirsty again keep coming here to draw water. She's thinking, okay, I'll take you up on your offer, you smart aleck. Give me that kind of water and I'll save myself this trip every day. You know, we lived in part of the world where it's still very primitive. The Ketchi women in Guatemala did this very same thing. Every morning early they'd go to get their water. And then late in the evening, they would go to get their water. And during the dry time of the year, the water was scarce, and the nearby places would dry up. And some of the catchy ladies would spend eight hours a day for their daily trek with water. And so this lady is thinking, all right, good. I'll make that deal with you. You can save me my eight-hour trip every day. And so the story goes on, verse 16. So he told her, this is kind of an interesting turn, isn't it? Go call your husband and come back. And I'm wondering if he was trying to convince her, I'm not here to flirt with you. And so she said, now picture the trampled rose. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. I picture her sighing, her countenance dropping, and dropping her head. And Jesus said, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Verse 19, she replies, Sir, the woman said, I think he's stopped her in her tracks now. I can see that you're a prophet. Now that would be a compliment. Wouldn't it? She's giving God credit for this man knowing all these things about her that she would just soon keep secret. You know, she thought, well, at least he's a stranger. He doesn't know my story. But all of a sudden, he does. And so she gives God credit for this. And uh, I think she's probably a little bit confused, though, because he has not been treating her with the disdain that she would have expected, but he's been treating her respectfully and being kind to her. When I was in college for just a brief period of time, a few months, I sold insurance. It was health insurance, and it was in Louisiana. I just lived just that far from Louisiana in Nacogdoches. A friend of mine sold insurance there, and he got me a job, and I got my license, and we would sell insurance. And so he was teaching me how to sell. And one of the things he taught me, he literally did, he said, hey, Robert, you know, you need to get people to like you so that they will buy from you. And so he said, when you go into a home, 
if the very first thing you'll do is ask them for a drink, you'll win them over. And it's, it's uh, you know, salesmanship and sales psychology and all that kind of stuff. And so I would do that. I mean, I'd make these calls in people's houses and their homes. I'd drive up my pickup and I'd go up to the front door and knock and say, Hello, this is who I am. I'm here to talk to you. You'd called me. And I'd go in and the first thing I would ask, I would ask for a drink. And you see, that's how Jesus started this conversation with this lady. And he was so in tune with human nature that he knew how to win people over. Even this lady, man, can you imagine how hard she would have been? But he asked her for a drink at the very beginning. And then he won her over and they were able to have this conversation. She knew that he knew that she was what he would consider, and everybody else, an immoral woman now. But if she's immoral, at least she can't be ignorant about spiritual things. And so I see her now, you know, I've, I'm kind of tuned in with God, and she goes on. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called him by name, didn't even know it, the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I wonder if she's getting a hint. And uh, again, she's brought into this conversation instead of just, you know, having wanted to be there alone. And then look what Jesus says in verse 26. This is worth the whole book of John. This one verse. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. The next time somebody you know, counters in a conversation with you about your faith. Say, you know what? You Christians claim all these things about Jesus, and he's just one of many prophets. And in fact, Jesus himself never did even say he was God. Y'all made all of that up. All you have to do is go to John four twenty six. No, Jesus said this himself. This is the interesting thing about this conversation. This is the first time he had ever said that. And he had admitted that. And look who he told. The girl trampled. And so she may not be allowed to be a witness in a court of law. But guess what? Jesus just entrusted her to being a witness in the world. He trusted her. He gave her that gift and so, he used that term, I am. You know, and that's the term that God used for himself all throughout the Old Testament. I am. That's what Jesus said, the one who's speaking to you, I am he. I am. So, look how Jesus treated this woman who had been so badly treated for so many years. You know, she knew thirst better, bigger than water, didn't she? Can you imagine, you know, the treadmill that she thought she was on? She just wants to be known and loved. It's like everybody else in this, all of us in this room. To be known and to be loved. And that's the very thing that she had never experienced. To be loved and to be known. And so, it was this woman to whom Jesus revealed this gift that we now know. Isn't that something? Look how he treated her. I want to go to the words of one of my you know, favorite guys to read, Timothy Keller. If any of you ever have a chance, or just go do it. Read some of his books. The Reason for God is the first one that I would recommend. But you can just do a web search and read this stuff. He is seen by many as the C.S. Lewis of our modern day. Very thoughtful very sensitive guy. And he said this, to be loved and not known is comforting but superficial. Can you imagine? That's what this lady had experienced over and over and over again. Loved and not known, superficial. But to be known and not loved is our greatest fear. I imagine she's thinking, Okay, at least he's a stranger and he doesn't know my story. She thinks she can hide behind the secret that she 
would like to keep, but in the community she couldn't. Lisa's a stranger, I'll keep my secret. But he knew her secret. Think of it. Sovereign God, omniscient, knows everything. Speaking of sovereign, I don't think this is a story that happened by chance. I think Jesus is very well aware. You know what? There's going to be a well. There's going to be a woman. And I want to have a conversation with her. I know that she's been trampled on. I know her already. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. I'm going to send the guys away. Because they won't get it. They won't get it why I would initiate a conversation with a woman, much less this woman. So he sends them away so he can have this conversation with her all by himself. Guys, I experienced that this week. And I'm not real academic about my preparations for these kinds of things. You know, I, sometimes because of your suggestions or whatever, you know, I, the passage is picked and I just spend the, the week in the passage. I read it over and over and over again. And as I was doing that this week, you know, I was spending time by that well with Jesus and this woman hearing their conversation over and over and over again. And you know what? We can all do that. I'm, I'm not special to be able to get these ideas out of this story. It's just a matter of sitting and waiting and being quiet and reading and listening. Do that over and over and over again. Each of you can do that. In fact, next week we're going to Actually, we're going to stop right here with this story this week. The story's not over yet. Like Paul Harvey used to say, and then the rest of the story. We're going to save the rest of the story for next week. It's incredible what happened because of this conversation that this woman had with Jesus. But just think about it. The power of one-on-one -on -one time with him. Man, oh man. Many of you experience that every single day. And you can testify the power of sitting quietly just with Jesus, an open Bible, spending time with him. That's what she did. Tomorrow night, the super moon is going to rise. Have you heard about it? Now, the moon's the same size every day. <clears throat> but since it travels in an elliptical orbit around the, the earth, you know, every once in a while, it's full while it's close. And that's what's going to happen tomorrow night. The moon will be full, and it, the full moon always rises as the sun sets. Have you ever noticed that? So tomorrow evening as the sun sets, catch the super moon. The super moon is going to be coming up, especially when it's close to the horizon. It's an optical illusion. It even looks bigger because of the contrast. It can be drawn with the things around it. Whatever it is, you're seeing it beside. But then as it gets on up in the sky, it just looks like the same moon that, you know, every month. But it's the super moon, not because it's bigger, but because it's closer. And that's what it is. That's exactly what I experienced this week. That's exactly what this lady experienced. She, ex she, expend she spent this time close to Jesus by that well. Something that you and I can do today. And you know what? You don't have to take anybody else's word for it. The story is going to end with the people saying, we don't believe of what you said. We believe because we have heard with our own ears. Well, that's what this woman experienced that day. Just think about it. Think of, in fact, we're going to read about it next week. The wind that it puts back in your sails and mine, when we're affirmed that way, when somebody expresses dignity to us, gives us that gift of their attention. And especially those of us who have some stuff in our lives that, you know, as long as I can keep them from you, then you may like me, but here she was with Jesus, totally exposed, all her secrets, bare and in the open. And yet, loving her intimately. And that's where Timothy Keller finishes up. But to be fully known and truly loved, it's well, 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 a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. I talk to college students who think 
They've got to clean their act up. Okay, I'm going to quit partying. I'm going to quit cursing. I'm going to quit the crude jokes. I'll get my act together. And then I'm going to get with God. But he won't want me the way I am now. Oh, you couldn't be any more wrong. Just the way we are. <laughs> All of our secrets born. Omniscient God knows all of our stuff. This is the Jesus that we see in this incredible, lovely story. So if you think that uh, you've been trod down, use this lady as an example for contrast. Not like her, but look how Jesus treated her. I bet he'll treat me the same way. Well, I'll make that guarantee. He will treat you the same way. Fully known, fully loved, because that's what God does. Let's pray together as we conclude. We'll pick up the story next week, and I'm just going to ask you to do it. Go ahead and spend some time at that well with me in the latter part of this story, okay? And uh, let's just read it all together, and then that way when we come together next week, we'll finish this story out and see the incredible things, the ways that God used this lady. And uh, you will beat me to the punchlines, I'll bet you. So let's read this story together this week. Let's spend some time at the well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you give us stories like these to help us overcome our fear of how hard you may be on us if you really started dealing with our stuff. Lord, there's no one in this room Whatever their secrets, whatever their regrets, there's nobody in this room that you would but welcome to sit by you and walk with you and spend the rest of their life with you. There's somebody who needs to give you a shot, give you that chance. I pray they'll do so now. For the rest of us, thank you for reminding us that we're fully known, fully loved. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.